I did not promote our Wednesday night Bible study, but let me just say this about it. There is something that you can know about heaven that can change your life from the minute you understand it. And there, that's what we're going to talk about Wednesday night. From the minute you understand it, it will change your life. And we're going to talk about that very thing this coming Wednesday night. Yes. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, business meeting, sorry about that. Uh, business meeting this Wednesday night, the following Wednesday night, is what we're going to be talking about. Thank you, Carol. Um, we're going to be continuing in Exodus for a little while. Exodus, we've talked about last week, and if you weren't here last week in the times we've been talking about this, and even through the Seder, we, we maybe seem like we're rushing things a bit this morning because we have got a lot of ground to cover, and we've already talked about a lot of these things. But Exodus picks up where really the Seder left, leaves off. At least where we started in Exodus picks up from where the Seder leads off. The Seder is about the Passover. This is about what happens immediately after the Passover. And the children of Israel are being led out into the wilderness. And they're learning how to walk with God. There's a lesson for us in the children of Israel learning how to walk with God. Because what do we need to do? We need to learn how to walk with God. Do we not? We need to learn moment by moment and day by day. And they're learning a very important lesson. And here's the lesson we need to learn. What they're learning is they're learning to trust God. They're learning to trust God. The word trust is, can also be the word belief. Also many times translated faith from the Greek. Faith, trust, belief. Do we really trust God? Sometimes when we say we have faith, we just go, well, I have faith. I've gone to church all my life. Can I tell you what that means? It means that you went to church all your life. It doesn't mean necessarily you know the Lord. And I want to talk to you this morning about walking in faith and a genuine belief that will allow you to trust in him and everything that he says and does. I'm going to be, you've got in your bulletin this morning a piece of paper that, is, that I'm going to be referring back to shortly. But I want to tell you about a man this morning that had great faith. And we'll talk about him just a little bit. If you want to read more about him, I would encourage you to do that. But what do we need to know? What about this Sabbath rest? We looked at that last week, this whole Sabbath rest idea, learning to rest in the Lord, rest in Christ. Does that mean we just go to a mountaintop and we lay down and we go, I'm waiting on you, Lord. I'm waiting on you. Well, what does this rest mean? What does it mean to have faith in Christ? Aren't we just to wait on him? Learning to wait is a very important thing. This discerning about this very subject is probably one of the most misunderstood things in all of Scripture. We talk about the grace of God, and then we talk about the laws of God. Which is it? Is it the law that we have to keep, or is it his grace, and his grace is totally sufficient, and I just rest in him, and I don't really do anything else. I don't need to do anything else, but just wait and trust in him. And that was something that I'm, that's something I'm concerned about for the church today, but it's also something that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was concerned about in his time, which was around the time of the end of the, the Second World War. His call was to a church as a pastor in Germany. And, and he had concern that there was people there that were not really walking by faith. And they were about to be tested in a way that they had never been tested before. And I'm concerned because I believe that all of us may be about to be tested in ways that we've never been tested before. And we need, we need to understand what it is to walk genuinely by faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need, we need to understand this. And, and he was preaching a message continually to his people about the cost of discipleship. Your salvation, let me, let me try to simplify this as best I can to lay a foundation for everything else I'm going to talk about this morning. Your salvation is a free gift of God. You accept Christ, it is a free gift of God. But make no mistake, that free gift is very costly. It cost us the Lord's life. He was beaten for our transgressions, persecuted for our transgressions, <coughs> hung on a cross and died for our sins. 
It was costly. And, and I think that we've come in the church today, in many cases, or I've, I've visited a lot of churches all over this country, and I'm very concerned that there are those that go, well, you know, I'm saved, so that's all that matters. It's about me. I'm saved, so it's all that matters. And, and, we, and there's not really a lot of trust in the Lord on a daily basis to say, here's what you need to do next. I'm trusting the Lord for my provision, yes, but I'm also trusting him to show me what's next and what he has gifted me for. And so this grace that is sufficient in my life are for those things that he has me to be about doing. And listen, that's not just for preachers. It's not just preachers. Every single Christian has a ministry to fulfill. You are, you are called according to his purpose. And he has a purpose in your life. And you're called for that purpose. So this whole idea of understanding the difference between a Sabbath rest and what work is. What is work? Work, as far as we're going to be talking about this morning, is about working for my salvation. My, my, I, I've learned to rest in the Sabbath rest. I am still learning that, that process. I am going through the process now of learning to rest in his, the work that he gives me. But there is a Sabbath rest. I'm not working, though, for my salvation. And I'm not working from the law. I'm working, listen to me carefully, because of his love. I'm working because of what he has done for me, and I desire so much to give something. And he says, yet there's not one thing I can do for my salvation. He's paid the full price. But he's given me something to do that has allowed me the privilege, the honor of serving him with my life. And he has given me resources. He's given me, he's given me gifts of the Spirit. And, and believe me, as I stand before you today, this is not the gift that I would have chosen 20 years ago. I, would, I was the guy who goes, okay, just you know, put me behind the scenes. I'll, I'll carry out the chairs and I'll set up the tables. I'm perfectly happy with all of that. And then God, listen to me carefully, answered a very dangerous prayer of mine. It went like this. It was simple. God, whatever it is, Use me. And he went, here's where I want you. And I went, no, not that. Is there a second choice, God? <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the nature of the human flesh. And generally we want somebody else's gifts. And I was just going, you know, just make me the guy behind the scenes doing this stuff. Liberty and responsibility. Is, is our responsibility, do we have a responsibility, first off, to Christ? Do we have a responsibility? Well, isn't that working for our salvation? Isn't that about the law? No? Why not? It is a reasonable act of worship. A reasonable act of worship. Our lives are about worshiping Him. It's, it's a joyful worship. It's not about the law. It's about love. It's about my natural response, my reasonable response to what He has done for me. And it comes from love. It doesn't come from law. The law is there. And let me tell you what, what is the law for? Let me ask you. What? To show us, to reveal to us our own sinfulness. And what happens in that? When you have your sin revealed to you, what happens? For me, it's like, oh, Lord, don't show me that. But then it's a, it's a matter of a response that says, I love you, Lord. Thank you so much for dying for even me. The law reveals me to me, and sometimes that's not a very pretty picture. In fact, let me just be honest. Quite often it's not a very pretty picture. But it also helps me come to appreciate and love him more and, and want to serve him more and more joyfully serve him. And when I do and I'm exhausted, as I told you last week, it's a good tired. It's a good tired. And I, and I enjoy serving. It's, it's, that's the way it should be, that we're serving out of a love because of our respect and our appreciation for who God is and what he has done for us. That's our reasonable worship. It's irrational 
to respond to the God-given liberty to us in any other way. Now, let me, let me talk a little bit about this liberty because everybody wants to talk about Christian liberty today. Does that mean that we're totally free? Well, we're free indeed. As the Bible says, we're free indeed. Let me, let me just, I, I believe it does mean that we are as free as we, as we ever want to be. And here's, and here's the reason why I can say that. Let me tell you a little story. There was, and this is an actual study that was done. There was a, a nursery school where there were about 50 children. And they had a playground that they, several times a day, they would let the children out on the playground. And they would just run all over the playground. They were free. And they played. And they had great time. And they, would, they used all of that playground up. They used it up. And it, it, was, it was a joy just to stand and watch them. And these social scientists came in and they made notes of all these little children, each one of them individually, how they responded to this freedom they had in this playground. And then they did something very interesting. They came in and they took down the fence around the playground. And they turned the children back out again. And what they noticed is they all congregated in these little pockets. And they would play, but they were leery because they had didn't have any protection. They didn't have the boundary there that they could just go out to and feel free in. And, and we as Christians, if we have genuine Christian liberty, we have this boundary that says everything in here is safe. You are safe here. You can love here. You can enjoy the Lord here. You can, you can and why do we become in these buildings occasionally? And, and maybe this is a fault of ours. We don't realize the boundaries are beyond the walls of this building. You have great liberty in the marketplace to go out and share Christ with people. And he's there. He's there in the midst of that. This liberty we have has boundaries for our good, for our protection, for our comfort, for our joy. And within that, he gives us all of this liberty to go out and serve him well. And that's really what this contrast, what this battle is about, even within the Christian faith today. Many people are going, well, it's all about just you have the grace of God, therefore you can do, go out and do anything you want, anytime you want, any way you want, and that's okay. If you want to just continue to do the same sin, what did Paul say? Heaven forbid. Why? Because we don't have that desire as Christians, people who have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. That's not a desire that we have anymore to fall into that sinful place. Our responsibility really is just to honor and glorify God. Amen? Amen? We need to be about honoring and glorifying Him. I want, I desire to bring honor and glory to my Lord. I desire to see each one of you as a pastor. This is the gift I've been given. And let me tell you, this is a gift because this is not my natural calling in my flesh. My flesh does not desire this, and it does not desire to pastor and be a shepherd to people. It is the gift of God, and in that giftedness, I have a longing to see each and every person here, and all those that couldn't make it here this morning, come to know the Lord in such an incredible way that you just want to honor Him and glorify Him. And as Pastor Tom said this morning, that it's not about you anymore. Yeah. It's not about, look what gifts God has given me. Oh, oh, I'm so good, don't you think? <laughs> That's not what it's about. It's for his glory. And every one of you have a ministry that takes us in. And that's our worship. That's what our worship is really all about. Let's look at this where we ended off last week. Colossians 2, 16 and 17. If you've got your Bibles and, of course, the verses up here for you as well. I was talking about these feasts and festivals and the Passover and the, the Jewish uh, leaders, the Pharisees, were saying you have, to be, you have to observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, and what that meant to them was keeping rules. You only could walk a certain number of steps a day. A chicken could lay an egg, but you couldn't take it out of the nest. I mean, it, there was all kinds of rules and regulations. And he says, you have more liberty in Christ than that. Christ, listen to me, Christ is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. It is in Him that we rest. Does that make sense to anybody? It's in Him that we rest. We rest in Him. We don't have to keep all of these things. And this, 
passage says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink and with regard to festivals or the new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow. We talked about last week, and we're going to talk a lot more about it this week. A shadow or a type, a type of what was to come. This is a shadow of that which will be fulfilled. And then it says, but the substance belongs to Christ. The substance belongs to Jesus. He is the substance of these things. These were just a picture, just a, just a type of thing. When Moses is leading the children in the wilderness, who, what is he a type of? He is a type of Christ, exactly. He is a type of Christ. He, he leads them out of bondage. He leads them from Egypt, the place of sin. He leads them out into the wilderness and across the Red Sea. He's a type of Christ. He is leading them and taking them out of their bondage, delivering them into the promised land. This is a type of Christ. Then we talked about the type, the manna was a type. It's a type of food. And the water we're going to find out today is a type. It's a, it's a type that represents something else concerning our, our, our Lord. So this, is, this whole thing is just a picture of something that we are to learn and that we are to learn for our own good. Now, I'm not just saying that. The Bible says that. So let's look, let's look at it. You're crossing the Red Sea, crossing from a, into a new identity. He said, you were slaves. You were in bondage. Now I'm delivering you through the sea into the, the place headed toward the promised land. You're on a journey. This is, this is where we are. We're on a journey. It's called sanctification. Amen? Everybody learned that yet? It's called sanctification. Say amen. All right. We're being sanctified, and we, got, we need to learn from what he has told us here. We're crossing over. Moses is a type of Christ, the cloud and the fire that led them in the wilderness, cloud, of fire, cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night is a, is a picture of the Holy Spirit's leading. So this fire was, rep, was representative of the Holy Spirit's leading in the wilderness. It's telling them and showing them where to go. And then the manna from God is God's spiritual provision, the food for you. What is the food for you? It's the Word of God. We are to take in and digest and live on the strength of the nourishment we receive from the Word of God. And that's what the manna was representing. We looked at last week. And let's say for everybody that was here last week, I think you will remember this. What does manna mean? Ah, what is it? It means what is it? All of these things were written, it said, the scripture says, as an example. So let's look at this, 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 13. Now we're going into the New Testament. This New Testament verse is going to look back at the very Exodus verses that we're talking about here. And it's going to tell us why, from a New Testament perspective, that these Old Testament verses are so critical for our Christian living. So listen carefully. Here it is. It's a lesson in types from Exodus. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. He says, I want you to know. I want you to be, I want you to be able to think and understand about these things reasonably. I want you to know, he says. I want you to know and not be unaware, brothers, that the father, fathers were all under the cloud. Who is the cloud? The leading of the Holy Spirit. In the time of Exodus, the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is external, comes upon people and leads them, and then at times the Holy Spirit leaves. What is our blessing in the New Testament, this side of the cross? He indwells us, and he continually is leading us. And one of the great lessons that we have to learn is to yield can you say yield? Yeah. Now, can you yield? Boy, it got quiet, didn't it, Pastor Doug? <laughs> yield to the Holy Spirit's leading. Because the Holy, Spirit's lead, the Holy Spirit was leading in the wilderness, and the people didn't want to go where the Holy Spirit was leading them. And we're going to see that they, they, they complained, and they, they fought bitterly against this. Uh, he says, I don't want you to be unaware that this cloud was leading your fathers in the wilderness, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food. What was the food they ate? The manna. What is our, our food, to, our spiritual food today? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. He says, you'll be nourished by this. 
and all drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock. We're going to look at the rock today that followed them, and all the rock, and the rock was Christ. You see, here is confirmation of the type. I told you last week, we don't, we don't just make this stuff up. The scripture confirms what are types and what are not types. Be very leery of somebody that stands up and says, this is what this means, and this is what this means, and this is what this means, and the wheel of Ezekiel, that's what this means, unless they point to a scripture that says this is what it means. Okay? Be careful. Because we can go down some weird roads. And I don't know any other way to say it but that. There are weird roads you can go down if you just accept this. So nevertheless, most of, uh, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, I want to focus in on this word overthrown because here's where we are today in the church, I think. Many people composing the body of Christ today, if we were to have the first strong wave of resistance against the Christian faith, I'm talking about a strong wave of resistance, two groups, two groups, Ethiopian Christians yesterday, were beheaded. What did they have to do? All they had to do was deny Christ. That's all. Just say the words. Just say the words. You don't have, you don't have to die. Yesterday. He said they were overthrown in the wilderness. One time King David describes himself this way. He said, my countenance has fallen. My countenance had fallen. What was he talking about? He's talking about this same uh, situation where you meet resistance and the children of God were overthrown in the wilderness. What does this word mean? The word means to be changed, to be pulled down, to be broken, to be destroyed. They had allowed themselves to allow the circumstances of life to cause them to not trust God any longer. And it came over and over and over again. And it came in very real, don't miss this, don't miss it, listen. It came in very real physical needs that they had. They needed those things, like water. It wasn't that they didn't really need them. It wasn't even that they were going, oh Lord, buy me a Mercedes Benz. It wasn't that. It was just, I need water, God. I'm dying here. But they weren't trusting God for those things. Listen to me, Christians. Hear me when I say this is, this is not totally without precedence for what's happening in the world today. Now, these things took place, listen, as examples for us. That's what the Scripture says. These things take place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Not to rise up to worship, not to rise up to glorify God, not to even rise up to thank God for the food and the drink they just had. But to rose up to play. We want to play. It's fun playing church. There's a lot of churches around that, that, are, that are quite satisfied to have no doctrine at all. And it's sad. It's a sad reality when we're talking more about how you feel than what God says. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble. Now, isn't it interesting that we see this grumbling and sexual immorality in the same passage? Does it tell us something about what God says is important here? Our grumbling is quite objectionable to God. And they were grumbling. They weren't, and what was grumbling? Grumbling is just not trusting that God's best is going to be accomplished through him in you. Grumbling. Now, these things happened to them as an example. They're telling us again, as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. 
This is written. Don't go, well, that's just Old Testament, Pastor. This was written, he said, for our instruction. We need to learn what it is that God has for us. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Let me, let me tell you something. The first time you go, I'm a humble man, you probably missed the point. The first time you go, well, I'm meeting all of God's expectations for me, you probably missed it. The first time you say, well, I'm trusting God with everything and then grumble about anything, you probably missed it. This Reality is what it is to live in the flesh. And what he's trying to get us to hear and see and do is live by the very Spirit of God, by his very leading that we yield ourselves to him and allow ourselves to be led by him, trusting him. Trusting him. They were trusting God. They had to be trusting God, did they not? To go in the, Well, they were trusted Moses, and then they complained against him when there was no water. Remember they got the Mara? What does Mara mean? Bitter, he got to the bitter water and they went, Moses, this water is bitter, it tastes nasty. Well, they're going to get to another place today that has no water. Beware lest God lead you from a place of bitter water to a place of no water. Amen? Okay. So here it is. Uh, the cloud of fire, the Holy Spirit, the manna is the spiritual provision through the word of God and the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Deuteronomy 8. It says God, and this is Deuteronomy 8, looking at this very event of the children of God wandering around in the wilderness and what took place in their lives as they did. He says, God humbled you and let you be hungry and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but by man lives by everything that proceeds from the mouth of God. The Word of God. The things that proceed, the, the scriptures are God breathed. The, this is, this is the, the, there's life in these there words. You got them? There's life there. It's God breathed. He breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. He breathed this word to give us spiritual life. And that's what we are to count on, is what his word said. Also, Jesus himself said of this manna incident. Now, isn't it interesting how many times this very incident is talked about in the New Testament? We've already seen about four so far. Now, Jesus himself is going to speak to this. He said this in John 6, 27. Do not work for the food which perishes. What did they do when, when Moses told them to not only gather what they needed? They gathered more and they tried to stick it back and make provision for themselves for later on. And what happened? It rots and it gets maggots and it stinks. And can you imagine if just a third of the crowd did that, the stench in the camp? Have you ever been in a place where there's animals' bodies rotting and the stench that comes from that? All this stuff's got maggots in it and it's stinking. He says, don't work for food which, in, which perishes, but work for eternal food which you can carry into eternal life. It endures to eternal life which the Son of Man will give you. John 6, For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I don't know if you remember, but we've preached some of these messages that I'm about to go into here, where Jesus talks about him being the bread of life. Do you remember any of that? Okay. Uh, then he said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. You want bread? You want something to eat? Come, partake of this bread. He gave it to the disciples in the upper room. He says, this is my body broken for you. This is the bread of life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. What were some of those things? Well, there's some types there. There's more provision in chapter 17. So now you're caught up if you hadn't been here the past couple of weeks. At the Lord's command, the whole community of Israel left the wilderness of sin. Remember I showed you that map? had the desert of sin on it down there. The desert of sin, we said the word sin, actually is a, is a word that means moon. And there was probably a moon god or goddess there that was being worshipped. But they're leaving that place. 
And they, they're told that they are going to move from place to place. They, just, they follow the cloud. They follow the pillar of fire. They move from place to place. Eventually, they camped in Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. So what did they do? So once more, the people complained to Moses, give us water to drink, they demanded. Now, before we get too quick to condemn the children of God, have you ever been thirsty? I'm a little thirsty right now. But I don't know that I've ever been completely without something to drink for an extended period of time. They're wandering around, and they come into Rephidim, and there's no water. So he's carried him from a place of bitter water to a place of no water, and they said, give us this. And so quiet, Moses replied. Why are you complaining against me, and why are you testing the Lord? What was he saying? There's a lack of trust. God brought you this far. He's provided manna. He's given you water. Trust God. And listen, instead of Christians complaining about this, that, and the other, wouldn't it be nice if we all just got together and said, we need to pray? Wouldn't that be nice? We're going to trust God. Let's come together and see what God's got for us. Let's pray. I remember calling the people in Colorado to prayer. We were going to get together and, and pray all night one night. We had one guy show up, and he was there about an hour, hey, but he was, he's doing better than some of the rest. But that's how much the Christian body thinks of prayer. You want to change things? Let the body of Christ come together and pray. It will make a difference. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. Why did you bring us out into Egypt? You were trying to kill us? Our children and our livestock with thirst, is that what you're trying to do? Then Moses cried out to the Lord and he says, what should I do with these people? They're ready to stone me to death. And so the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people, take your staff, that staff that you brought out to the Nile and the Red Sea, remember that staff, you struck the Nile, and call the elders of Israel together. Here's a script, a very spiritual, biblical thing we should do is call the elders together and put them there and have them join you in this place. I will stand before you on the rock at Mount Sinai. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of Mount Sinai. I'm actually going to show you a picture next week. But if you've ever been through the desert southwest and there's this desert and then all of a sudden you see this rock just gorging out of the earth, just going up at a weird angle, That's what sort of Mount Sinai looks like. It just goes up for several hundred feet. It's a huge rock. And they come to this rock, and Moses struck the rock as he was told, and water gushed out as the elders looked on. Now, this probably wasn't like the felt board I saw when I was in Sunday school, where there was this little rock, you know, and, and Moses struck it, and there was this little puddle coming out. This water had to quench the thirst of two million people. This was probably like turning on a hundred fire hydrants. Here comes the water. It's got, to, it's got to settle two million people in the livestock of those people. So the, the, here's the elders watching all this. Are we ready to trust God now? Um, I don't know. Let's see. Moses named the place Massah, which means test and Meribah, which means arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord here with us or not? Now, I want you to notice here, the people aren't doubting God's existence. They're not even doing that. I think a lot of our people in churches today are even doubting God's existence. I told you the other night uh, about this group called the Jesus Seminar. They, they, they doubt whether Jesus was even a material being or not. He was just sort of a figment of somebody's imagination or, or a nice ideology to try to attain to. And they call themselves Christian scholars, these guys. And they're well thought of by the media. They'll call them on them to, to make comments about the Christian community and the Christian response. But they, they, these people are not even doing that. They just say, is he with us or not? What were they saying? Can I trust God? Can we really trust God? I mean, this is the desert. Now, if we, were, if we were back home where we could turn the spigot on and water came out hot or cold as we desired, maybe we'd trust God then. If things are really great, 
then maybe we'll trust God then. Maybe we need to trust him in the good times and appreciate him and thank him and praise him during those times. What do we have a tendency to do? Look how good I am. Boy, I got, I got it going on, don't I? Look at my barns, they're full. But in the bad times, too, we have a tendency to not come to the Lord except to complain. They're not doubting his existence. Let's just look at some of these types. Water is a type. Let's look at John 7, 37. Again, we're going New Testament. Jesus stood and cried out, saying, see if you remember this verse. Well, I've preached on this since I've been here. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Anybody have a memory of when that is? Yeah, one of the festivals. He, the the, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles, in the middle of the Feast of Fab- Tabernacles, there is a festival of water where the priest comes out and he gathers the water at the Pool of Siloam in a pitcher and he carries it and all the people are following him and he goes into the temple courtyard and he climbs up on a high stand and he begins to lift the pitcher higher and the people are going higher, higher, higher. They keep getting louder and louder and there's a bowl down here and he begins to pour the water and when he does, the people go silent. That was part of the ritual, part of the, part of the way that they did the, the feast of this water ceremony and it was to remind them that they'd come through the water and they've got, suddenly when the water begins to pour, they want to hear it splash in that bowl and those that are right beneath the stand have it splash on them and and they get quiet and Jesus stands up and he says, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me and drink and, and he won't thirst again. Look what he says. He who believes in me, and as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now I want you to notice he didn't say, believe in me with a casual belief. Believe in me when I perform what you want in your timing. He says, those who believe in me, from them will come floods of rivers of living water that will come pouring from them. If you've ever had the experience, and I I have on occasion had this experience where I I get through with doing some ministry. Several times in Africa I can think about, I remember one time particularly preaching in front of a liquor store in a black township, and, and I thought, they kept saying, preacher, Preach right here. Preach right here. And I'm going, not in front of the liquor store. I mean, anywhere but here. Can't we go over on the hillside, you know, get a little more remote? And they said, no, right here. This is where you need to be, preacher. I said, okay, set it up. Put up some speakers, and I started preaching. And people started coming out of the liquor store, and they got two deep and five deep and 20 deep. And people were standing all around just like, it was amazing. And I'm watching this, and I stand back at the end, and I go, rivers of living water. This is about him and his power. Pastor Tom preached about the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit speaking through you. And you stand back and you go, God, I I can't say I had anything to do with that, but look what you did here in front of a liquor store in a black township in South Africa. And I can remember standing back and going, that's the power of God. That's the power of God. So the water and the Spirit are connected together. We see that the water is a type of the Spirit. He's... And what are types for? Types are to teach us something. He says, I tell you this as an example so that you would have instruction. Remember the passage we just looked at? So that you would have instruction. The Holy Spirit we need to yield to. And as we do, as we yield to the Holy Spirit's leading and we genuinely say, okay, Lord, here's my prayer. It's a dangerous prayer. Whatever it is you want to do with me, Lord, I'm yielding. It's a dangerous prayer. It is a remarkable prayer. And when it is sincere and God moves in, he will change your heart. Listen, I would not have given even this hour for any of you in here 30 years ago. It was all about me. And that's what God can do to you. And see, most of us, though, we don't want any of that. I I fought going to Africa for over 20 years. I mean, literally ran from the opportunities. And by the way, I, I, 
I had no formal training at that time. They just kept saying, they called me Maruti. Maruti means preacher. Maruti, set up here. Maruti, Maruti. I'm going, I'm not the preacher. I'm not the preacher. They go, yeah, you are. You're the, you're the guy from America. Maruti, right there. <laughs> There's also we find in John chapter 4, Jesus answered and he says, if you knew the gift God gave you, what is this? What's, what's the occasion here? The lady at the well. She's at the well. We, we, I preached this a few months ago. She asked you for a drink, and, he, and you have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And she, Sir, she says, you have nothing to draw in this well from. It's deep. Where are you going to get this living water? Jesus answered her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up into eternal life. This is Jesus as the rock. God providing for his people. Moses stood in the wilderness, he struck the rock, and in, the, in striking the rock and inflicting upon the rock and the stripes of hitting the rock, the people received what they needed. And he gave to us, he said, go to Jerusalem, you apostles, go to Jerusalem and pray and don't do a thing until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And when he does, you'll be given power from on high. Just go there and pray and wait. And when he comes upon you, then be ready to serve. The Holy Spirit came upon him. He gave him food, uh, the word of God. Quenching the hunger and thirst is never, listen to me, is never permanent. I'm going to close with this. <clears throat> Imagine this. A friend of yours, a good friend, comes to you and says, you know, I'm not feeling very well. I don't know what it is, Dave, but I'm nauseous. I, I, I'm, I'm just not feeling good. Uh, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I got a headache just on the verge of happening. I'm, I, I just don't, I don't have anything that feels good about me. And, and, and he goes on to describe all the symptoms that he's got. And he says, I'm just not, he says, there's something bad wrong with me. And you're concerned. And so you go, well, you know, maybe it's something you ate. And he goes, well, no, it couldn't be because I hadn't eaten anything in a couple of weeks. And you go, well, Dummy, you need to eat. We all need to eat. We need to be fed. We need to be nourished by the Word of God if we're going to walk in the faith, do we not? We need this spiritual water, this Holy Spirit, indwelling us, quenching our spiritual thirst, do we not? Otherwise, listen, you're going to be sick. You're going to be sick. And this is, just, this is just, you know, a, a, a preacher standing here telling you this, but you don't eat, you're going to be sick. You don't have the spiritual nourishment. If you don't go someplace, there's meat. We meet here on Wednesday nights. We go into the deeper things of the Word of God. It's the meat. It is, it is and it's, hey, the way I delivered, it's even got some bones still left in it, Okay. But we're, we're into the deeper meat of the Word of God. I want you to spit a few bones out along the way. I, I, want, you, I want you to take that in and be, and be fed by that. You need to be, have your hunger and your thirst quenched. And it's the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Say it with me. The Spirit of God and the Word of God. It's not the Spirit of God or the Word of God. You hear me? There's a whole lot of churches going, well, I was just moved by the Spirit. Well, was it confirmed in the Word? No, it didn't have to be confirmed in the Word. I was moved by the Spirit. What Spirit is that? Be careful. There's a, there's a lot of imitating spirits out there. We must drink and we must eat daily. We must if we're going to be nourished. We absolutely must. Now, before I pray, I want to give you a little history of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Here's a man that served God as a pastor in Germany. He was called to be a pastor there, and he became such a great theologian, they called him to teach in some of the seminaries. And he taught in the seminaries, but his calling was to be a pastor. And so he went to his church, and he began to, to preach and teach, and people came to know the Lord. About this time, the Nazis moved into Germany, and they began to take 
Christians and Jews and persecute them and kill them, take them into concentration camps. And Bonhoeffer did everything he could, including act sort of in the underground to figure out a way to get Jews and Christians out of Germany. And he, he formed this sort of underground railroad kind of situation through his brother-in-law who was a higher up in the Nazi government. But it was all kind of undercover and they began to figure this out. But the, the churches in Germany then became state churches. They were, run by, they were run by the state and they were there to serve the state. And what the state said, they did. And, and there, I, I went back and watched this week. I've stood in the very place that Hitler spoke at the rally grounds in, in, in Nuremberg, Germany. The very rally grounds are right the place that he stood. I've stood there. And he had millions of people out standing before him. And he said things like this, the Lord is with us. And the church would back him up. And, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer wasn't having any of it. And he began to teach. And he was concerned because he called what he called a cheap grace. That people really weren't convinced of the grace of God in that he would change their lives and use them for his service, but just the grace of God fall on me and everything's cool. And he knew this, this wave of Nazi fight was, was coming. He knew it was coming. Here's what he said. I'm not going to read all of this, but it's, but it's for your benefit. Cheap grace is a deadly enemy of the church. We are fighting today a, for a costly grace. It costs something. Cheap grace means grace sold on the marketplace like cheap jacks wares. The sacraments of forgiveness of sin, the consolation of religion as thrown away at, the, at cut rate prices. Grace is represented as the church inexhaustible treasure from which she showers blessings in generous hands without asking any questions or fixed limits. Grace without a price, grace without a cost. The, essential, the essence of grace, we suppose, is that we account has been paid in advance and because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Cheap grace means grace as a doctrine, a principle, a system, a means of forgiveness, watch this, a means of forgiveness for sin, proclaiming as a, as a general truth the love of God taught as a Christian conception and the intellectual assent that the idea held to be itself sufficient, the secure remission of sins. And he goes on to talk about that this was done without any expectation of repentance. Now what is repentance? Repentance is turning and going the other way. Listen, when God convicts us, it's not an occasion in which we go, okay God, I hear you, now forgive me. God does expect, because of our love for him, not because of the law, but because of our love for him and our appreciation for what he has genuine, genuinely done, that we will turn and go the other way, under conviction. That's expected of us. It is, a, it is a result of our salvation and not a price for our salvation. But as saved human beings that understand that God is who he says he is and that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, that when he died for us, he died for my sins. He atoned for me. That when he did that, that there should be some natural response of my love for him. If I know him. Is that natural response of love, does it result in anything but serving the living God? I say to you, no. We must serve him. And it is our reasonable worship. Cheap grace means the justification of sin without justification of the sinner. Boy, is that a mouthful. Justification of sin without justification of the sinner. Hmm. Grace alone does everything they say, and so everything can remain as it was before. All sin could not, be, could not atone. Well, then, let Christian life like the rest of the world and we just live like the rest of the world. Let, the, let them model for ourselves what the world standards are so we can live them. We don't go on the same as we were. Listen, when Christ moved into my life, everything was changed. Everything was changed. It was changed from the inside out, and it wasn't that I was immediately healed of everything that, that 
confounded my life and hurt me. It wasn't that I was, I was taken out of any desire for sin. Listen, this brain that we have, it has what, what scientists now are calling muscle memory. It has this muscle memory of, of going about sin as we always have, doing the same thing we always have because it's, it's, it's habit. It's a muscle memory that, that kicks in. But what does happen when that muscle memory kicks into my life and wants me to drag me back down into a pit of sin, the Holy Spirit of God speaks to my heart, confronts me with it, and expects me to turn and go the other way. At his response to my sin, I need to turn and repent and go the other way. This is the expectation God has. Not because, listen, again, not because of law, but because of love. This is, the, this, is the, this is the word of God. What, by the way, the end of the story for, for this great man of God is this. Seventy years this past week since he died, Dietrich Bonhoeffer gathered together some Christians and Jews, managed to put things together to get on a plane to come to the United States. He was getting them out of Germany. And he got here, and he said he was immediately convicted but you've left some behind. You've left them and they need a leader and you're their leader. He's free. He's free indeed. He is in the United States of America and he is a free human being. He doesn't have to do anything. He's got them out. But God convicts him. He gets back on a, on a ship and he goes back straight into the heart of the battle. Two weeks before the end of World War II, the Germans knew they were losing. They knew that things were coming to an end. They knew that things were about to, to crack wide open. And here's what they did. They plucked Dietrich Bonhoeffer from the cell, which he had served in for about four years, and they took him to the gallows and they hung him on the gallows two weeks before the end of the war. This is one of the great heroes of the faith. He went back to serve the living God in the way that God had called him. God had called him there, and when he got to America, he said, I made a mistake, and he turned, and he went back to fulfill his call. Every single one of you, listen to me carefully. Don't miss this. Everybody look at me. Every single one of you have a call. Every one of you. Don't miss your call. Don't miss your call. Father God, we thank you so much. We praise your holy name. We ask you to come in, Lord, and be glorified in this place. I pray, Lord, today that we would answer our call faithfully, that we would be about our Father's business, that we would sing your praises from the rooftop and we would witness to every being that would stand still and listen, that we'd be bold enough to chase those that want to run away, and that we would share our faith with the lost and the dying world. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.